Please be seated. We are very privileged this week to have uh, as the concluding preacher for our missions conference, uh, Sandy Wilson, who's a senior pastor at Second Presbyterian Church in Memphis. I said uh, earlier that uh, Presbyterians used to be even less creative in naming churches than we are now. We just named them first, second, third, fourth. We got to Philadelphia, we named one even tenth. Uh, so that's why you have these uh, strange numbers. And uh, we even had a second pres in uh, Augusta at one time. But we are very grateful to have him as the leader of that church, which has been a long time leader, bright shining light for the gospel in uh, Memphis, and especially over the last 17 years uh, since Sandy has been there, reaching, uh, desiring to, daring to reach into every single neighborhood in the uh, Memphis area. But before that, he was pastor of Lookout Mountain Presbyterian Church in Chattanooga, which is where I met him and where Jackie, who was uh, then my fiance, met his wife, Allison, who took her under her wing as well. And uh, we were, they made a powerful impression on us. I say that um, I have this kind of family album in my mind of great men and women who have made an impact on me as a minister and as a man of God. And one of the very special pages of that family album is, uh, has Sandy Wilson at the top. And there are a number of things I could tell you that uh, in ways in which he has made powerful impression on me in the ministry and as a man, a leader of a family and prayerfulness in ministry, methodical approach to problems in the kingdom, so forth. But the most uh, stunning impact that he made on me as a, as a young man in college was the realization that somebody who was not only Reformed but also Presbyterian could preach with passion and freedom and even joy. And, and taking up the great Puritan tradition, which was uh, that the fourth characteristic of the Puritan life was not only sobriety, justice, and piety, but laughter. And that's what you'll realize from him today. You've already tasted it on Friday night, but you'll experience it morning and evening. A man who exemplifies the joy of the gospel as well as preaches it. We are highly honored that you are here. Come preach the gospel to us. Thank you so much, George, for those uh, kind words. And I and all the missionaries here are particularly grateful to you and Jackie for your warm hospitality. And I can say to you, uh, George left a deep impression upon me too. Even when he was a senior uh, at Covenant College, he was president of the student body and a very articulate person, obviously a godly person with desires for pastoral ministry. And all of us in the ministry were so glad to see him and others uh, who take up those interests of leadership in the church. And speaking of humor, you know, for those of us like George and myself uh, who serve in the church, you all provide much a cause for humor uh, in our lives. Uh, there are so many things in the church that, of course, are very sad, but you, you, you folks are just very funny. Uh, one time, uh, uh, the great Baptist preacher, Charles Spurgeon, uh, had shared some things with his congregation that made them laugh, and, and one of the older ladies came up to him afterwards and said, uh, Mr. Spurgeon, I really think you should refrain from some of these funny things you're saying from the pulpit. And he said, Madam, if you only knew what I was holding back. <laughs> One time he was asked uh, uh, about uh, his cigar smoking, and uh, someone said, Mr. Spurgeon, uh, how can you uh, smoke those cigars and be a Christian? He said, well, I believe in moderation. <laughs> and uh, the person said to him, so Mr. Spurgeon, what is that? And he said, One at a time. One time, the great evangelist D.L. Moody came to see him uh, on a preaching tour in England, and he knocked on the, f on the door of, of Mr. Spurgeon's flat, and Mr. Spurgeon came out with one of his cigars. And Mr. Moody, you know, an American evangelical, he looked at Mr. Spurgeon, and he said, you're a Christian and you smoke? And Mr. Spurgeon said to him, you're a Christian and you're fat? <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I just took some of my preaching time, but I couldn't help it. If you only know what I held back uh, this morning. You'd... Folks, uh, it is a delight to be at First Presbyterian Church. You have a very long history. Second Presbyterian has a long history. And it's a great privilege to come into 
movements and churches like that that have been serving their neighborhood and the world for so long. And for us to take up our part as relatively young people and seek to carry on the great traditions of our forefathers. Some of you didn't grow up here. This is not your home church. It's become your home church. Let me just say, you just got grafted in to a wonderful tradition. It's the tradition of the gospel. And this church has been known for a very long time as a missions-oriented church. And I commend you for that because missiologists tell us today that only 11% of North American churches have anything in their budgets for external mission. That tells me that 11% of our churches are converted. And I think that'd be about right. And missiologists furthermore say that there are only 4% of North American churches that take the mission very seriously and put it front and center like you do. And rather than those of us in that 4% complaining because nobody else is doing the work around here, let me just tell you, we are highly honored to be the servants of Jesus Christ, to have heard his voice, and to believe enough in him to know that he wants us to partner with him in this great mission. And what we've been looking at this weekend is asking ourselves the question, is our life our best answer? to the Great Commission. Friday night we looked at the Great Commission as it involves your city. And one of the great delights in coming back to First Presbyterian Church after several years of not having seen you is to see how aggressive you've become not only in international mission, but in mission to your city and taking every neighborhood seriously and every person seriously regardless of their racial background or their socioeconomic background or their educational background. And that's something that professional churches, largely professional churches like this one and like the one I serve, need to take very seriously. We have for too long tried to define the gospel and what it means for professional, educated, more or less elite people. And what we found is the gospel doesn't work when you do that. We've truncated the gospel. And what's so delightful is to come and see how you're embracing all of the gospel opportunities that are around you. And I commend you in the Lord Jesus Christ for this. Now, this morning, we want to look particularly at the world, the international scene, and it is quite a scene because the, the world that we live in is a very poor world. Over half the people in this world live on $2 a day or less. Most of us cannot feature such a lifestyle. We wouldn't even know how to begin. So many in this world do not have adequate health care, do not have food to eat. There are 840 million starving people right now in the world. That's amazing given the resources that are available. What's the problem? It's not lack of resources in the world. It's lack of passion and resolve to meet the demands that are before us. We live in a very poor world. Anyone in this country who lives above the poverty line, which for us in, with a family of four would be $24,500, something like that. Anyone who makes that much money is in the top 10% of wage earners in the world. And anyone here who makes $50,000 a year is in the top 1% of wage earners in the world. We live in the wealthiest nation, the wealthiest culture in the history of the world. We have 5% of the world's population. We consume 20% of the world's goods. 25% of its oil resources. And of all the military spending in the world, we spend 48% of it. Almost half of the military spending in the entire world is for ourselves. We're well defended. We have plenty of resources. We're well fed. We basically get what we want, take the vacations where we want to take them, while most of the world is in poverty. Of the 192 nations in the United Nations, 50 of them are nations that live with the overwhelming majority of their people in what we would call extreme poverty. That would be less than one dollar a day to live on. It's a very poor world. It's also a very lost world. We have nearly seven billion people in the world. Three and a half billion of them are in several religions. The Muslim religion, the Hindu religion, and the Buddhist religion. And let's go ahead and throw in the Chinese folk religions. And that's about three and a half billion people. Eighty-six percent of those people do not know a Christian personally. And we believe something very important 
as Presbyterians. We believe that everyone that we know in this world is going one place or the other. They're either either going to heaven or to hell. When we all appear before the judgment throne of Christ, there will be sheep on the right, goats on the left, no geep in the middle. Only sheep and goats. Only the saved and the lost. Furthermore, we believe that the only way the saved will be saved is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Through faith in Him. Furthermore, we believe the only way that a person could have faith in Jesus Christ is if they hear the gospel. And furthermore, we believe that we're the ones who are to take the gospel to the people who must hear it in order to believe in Christ, in order that they might be saved. And that's the reason we're here this morning. We believe these things. And what we need to ask ourselves this morning is do we believe them enough? And in our lifestyles, are we reacting in such a way that it is obvious that we believe these things? You know, when I uh, became a Christian in New England, of all places, here's a, a boy who grew up in the South in a Southern Baptist church, but I wasn't converted until I got into a Presbyterian church in New England. Can you imagine that? And I become a Christian there, and I, I'm introduced to world missions there. And I'm so grateful for that. You should be grateful if you're a new Christian that you happen to have landed right here. Because the gospel includes missions. Missions is not an add-on. It's intrinsic to our faith in Jesus Christ. You should be grateful that you landed in such a place. I was grateful too. And one of the delights was the pastor that we had at the time. He had three children, the youngest of which was a Down syndrome child, who, of course, was very special not only to his family but to all of us. He loved to imitate his daddy, the preacher. So we had a processional, and the Bible would come down, and the crucifer, and the beetle carrying the Bible, and Gene was always the beetle in a choir robe, dragging the ground, eight years of age, and he would come up on the pulpit and set the Bible there, and he had done his task to help his daddy preach the Bible. And then in the evening, that was Gene's favorite time because he got to collect the offering, and he would always wear one of his daddy's vests. It was usually the red one that went down to his ankles. And he would come down the middle aisle with Bill McKenzie, the deacon who would help him collect. And the two of them would come right down and stand in front of the lectern while Roger would lead us in prayer. And then Gene would start to collect the offering on this side. And Bill would collect it on that side. And about when he got to where you are, Gene was collecting the offering and he got to Dr. Ed and Mary Tinney, two of the old pillars in our church, who I'm sure gave generously in the morning. But since the plate was being passed in the evening, they had already given, they just simply took the plate from Gene and they handed it back. Gene looked at the plate. (laughs) And he looked at Ed and Mary Tinney. And he handed it back and went. (laughs) And you've never seen two old people move so fast in all of your life. Mary started to get into her purse and try to find a bobby pin or something to put in there. And Ed was checking all of his pockets, see if he had anything that he could put in the plate to get Gene off their back. Of course, the rest of us in the congregation, we knew nothing about the rest of that service. I don't remember the sermon or anything. I just remember Gene and Ed and Mary. And you know, from that day, I used to, used to contemplate, was that Jesus visiting us that day through this little boy? And I've often wondered, you know, if Jesus were taking the offering here, how many times he'd just go like this and hand it back to you. And when you take these cards that are in your bulletin, with our opportunity to respond to the Great Commission, I've often wondered if Jesus would just hand you the card back and say, you might want to fill that thing out again. And this morning, as we come to studying the Word of God for a few moments, I want you to be thinking about what is Jesus saying to all of us? And what is He saying in particular to you? And what is the right response today? One of the beautiful things about a missions conference is that we get the opportunity to give a tangible response to the Great Commission, and you have that opportunity today. And you see in your bulletin insert the wonderful causes that extra giving would be going for. And you get to see how you can offer yourself as a living sacrifice here in this community by being involved in ministries and going on short-term mission trips and perhaps even a long-term mission career. You can study and pursue that and get counseling for it, and you can certainly offer to pray for the missionaries. Would you please do that today? And tonight, we all get to come to back, get back together with joy 
and offer our lives to the Lord as sweet-smelling sacrifices to Him. Now, if you want to know this morning what is it that we should be doing, let's look to, to the text of what Jesus gives us in the gospel account. Please turn to Luke chapter 10, and we'll look at these 16 verses together. This is the answer. It's on-the-job training with the Lord Jesus Christ, listening to Him, watching Him, and then discerning what it means for us in our own day and time. Luke 10, verse 1. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank You for being our missionary coming down from heaven and all the comforts thereof to take up a dwelling place with us in our poor and broken world, who humbled yourself and who divested yourself of all the accoutrements of your glory, that we might be saved and have eternal life. Lord, grant to us that same passion, that same heart, the heart of our our Savior, even as we study your word this morning. Revive us, Lord. Is zeal abating while harvest fields are vast and white? Revive us, Lord, the world is waiting. Equip your church to spread the light. This we pray in your matchless name. Amen. Luke 10, 1, hear the word of God. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there, and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet, we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this. The kingdom of God is near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. He who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me. But he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. This is the word of God. In the moments that we've got, I I want us to look at seven mission principles that we need to learn from the Lord Jesus Christ and apply into our lives this very day. And the first one you'll find in verse 1, and it is this. The Christian mission is every Christian's mission. The Christian mission is not the missionary's mission. The Christian's mission is not the mission's conference speaker's mission. The mission's conference is not the mission. The Christian mission is not the pastor's mission. The Christian mission is every Christian's mission. It's for you and for your children and for your grandchildren, every single one of them. If we're brought into Christ... We are brought in on on the missions team. Now, why do I say that? Well, if you'll look in verse 1, we find that he is appointing 72. Now, why 72? We should expect that Jesus did this very intentionally, just as he did when he appointed the 12. And you say, why did he pick 12? Well, I'm sure there were 12 men that he intended to have on his team. You find the shields of those apostles right there on the face of your balcony. But 12 represented the tribes of Israel. And it seems very obvious to most biblical theologians that when Jesus appointed 12, he was in effect saying, we are creating the new Israel. So God is building Israel on the platform of the old Israel in the Old Testament, and he's engrafting the Gentiles. 
And through these apostles, he's building an international church, which is his nation, his Israel. Now, we should expect somewhat the same thing when he recruits this larger team to send them out two by two. So what's the, what's the meaning, the symbolic meaning of 70 or 72? Well, if you look in the Old Testament, there are a couple of possibilities. Some scholars say, well, it's because there are 70 nations in the table of nations in Genesis, and Jesus is sending them out to all the nations. But, of course, he sends them out two by two, so that would only be 36, wouldn't it? So it seems to me that the better possibility is that when the children of Israel went to Egypt at Joseph's provision, there were 70, or some say 75, they were in the range of 70 there. And what it seems that Jesus is doing is saying, this is the new people. This is the Israel of God. He takes that number 70, which was precious to the Israelites who had been in captivity in Egypt and slavery. And he says, we're going to recruit and send out 70 more. He's saying this is the whole church in effect. And when he gathers the 500 with him at the last day in Matthew 28, what does he say? He says, go. He doesn't say some of you. He doesn't say, I want most of you to provide resources. I want just some of you to go. No, he says, I want all of you to make disciples of all nations. So every single Christian makes disciples of all nations. Now, most of us will stay here in Augusta. So we'll make disciples of all nations right here in Augusta. We're responsible for the rest of the world. So we either go to a part of that world ourselves, or we engage that part of the world through our agents, our missionaries, for whom we pray and whom we support with our financial uh, provision, and we support them with our words of encouragement and our very lives as brothers and sisters. We take responsibility for the entire world, one way or the other, either personally or through other agents, because we all are in the Christian mission. That's the first point we all have to get this morning. And I just want to say to some of you who have kind of remained on the fringes, every, every healthy church like this one has some folks who have not yet decided they want to get deeply involved. Let me say to you, come on in. You'll never have a more thrilling task in all of your life than to seek to advance the kingdom of God. I know both as a layperson in business as well as a minister of the gospel, there's no job more thrilling than this one. Now, secondly, Notice that the Christian mission is a global mission. Now, why do I say that? Look again once again at verse 1. He sends the 72 out, two by two, to every town and place where he was about to go. So he sends them to every village. And I ask you, what villages are we talking about here? Well, look back in chapter 9, where you see the beginning of what's known as Luke's famous central section. And this central section is the section of Jesus' teaching and his lifestyle that was between Galilee and his arriving in Jerusalem to sacrifice himself as a forgiveness for our sins. And on the way here, this central section, we find that he goes through no, none other than Samaria, the hated nation of Samaria. Look in verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. Every Jewish boy's mama told him, I don't want to catch you dead or alive in Samaria. It's a wicked place. There are nothing but apostates there. And they worship demons. And they have, they have synchronized the true religion with their pagan ideologies. And I don't want you over there. And here goes Jesus, right where the mothers told him not to go. And he goes into a Samaritan village. He sends them out two by two to hit every Samaritan village, the place where nobody wanted to go. And folks, we have places in this world where we need people to go. We have 6,909 languages in this world, and there are 2,252 that don't have one word of the Bible translated. We need some translators. We need people to go to the cities of this world, especially where people do not know Christians and have never heard the name of Christ, not even in a curse word. And we need 20,000 missionaries from the American church right now, and they come from pews like the ones in this room. So if you're willing to consider such a thing, be sure and let that be known on the card you're filling out this afternoon. Because this is a global mission. It's a global mission because God created the heavens and the earth. He owns it all. 
And the only right thing for every square inch of this universe to do is to rise up in praising their Creator and the Redeemer. And that's what we must do. As the great missionary Henry Martin said when he went through India and saw all the funeral pyres and all the wickedness and the idolatry, he said, it would be hell to me if Christ were always thus dishonored. And that's the passion of someone who worships God in this room is that you demand that He be worshipped everywhere. It's not enough for us to gather in this room. We read Psalm 67 and we hear how God says, May all the nations praise you. Well, there's nothing that would be appropriate other than that. And anyone who sincerely worships in this room ministers in the world outside of this room. It's the same passion. The passion of a worshiper is the passion of a world missioner. It's a global mission. Now thirdly, notice in verse 2 that the Christian, Christian mission is a prayerful mission. The first thing he told them to do is ask the Lord of the harvest to raise up workers. Before we preach, before we go, before we serve with our hands and feet, we must be sure that we are a prayerful community. Five o'clock this afternoon, somebody here is going to pray for missions. On your card today, you have the opportunity to commit yourself to regular prayer for one of your missionaries or one of your projects. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most important thing to do to get the gospel around the world, is that the people will bow down and pray, God, raise up workers for these harvest fields. That's our first task. Some of you, like myself, are tied into Operation World you know, the thick book that describes every nation and all of its prayer needs. And if you want to, since uh, I'm, I'm not a great prayer, no matter what George said about me, uh, I have to carve things down to where my little kindergarten prayer life can, can, can work. And so I, I get it on my iPhone every day, a nation to pray for. And it tells me how many people live in that nation, and it tells me what percentage of them are believers. And I'm s astonished every t month with... The numbers of countries that have less than 1% believers, less than 2% believers, less than 5% believers, they're all over the world. And I find myself praying for them every day. Whatever it is for you, we're praying for your missionaries, praying for the world. We've got to be a church who prays to the Lord of the harvest to gather in His people through the ministries of His people. Now, fourthly, notice in verse 3, the Christian mission is not only every Christian's mission, and a global mission, and a prayerful mission. It's a very costly mission. Look at how it's put in verse 3. He says, go. That is, now you're praying. Now get on the move. We're going to do something on our feet as well as on our knees. Go. I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Brothers and sisters, last time I checked, wolves eat lambs. It sounds like we're being put into a mission where we're going to get eaten up. And unfortunately, in the Western, especially the American church, with all the privileges that we enjoy and all the protections that we enjoy through people like my own son who fight international wars in foreign places against all kinds of people, with all these privileges, we've assumed that if you give your life to Christ, things are just always going to get better for you. And in our culture, there's a sense in which this is true. You're a more honest person. You're a harder worker, working person. You're more trustworthy. You get elevated. You usually make more money if you give your life to Christ. And it's badly distorted the gospel. This is the minority report. The majority report around the world is that when you give your life to Christ, you'll be destroyed. And all you have to do is look at the shields of the apostles along the face of your balcony. And you find one man after another who was put to death because he proclaimed Jesus Christ and lived it out. All 12 of them, with the exception of John, who died in exile as an old man on the Isle of Pat Patmos. All the rest of them, crucified, flayed, beheaded, for one simple reason, they engaged the Christian mission. And what we have to realize as members of the apostolic church that when we come to Christ, as Bonhoeffer said, we come to die. We must give up all the things that our wicked little hearts dream for, for ourselves, our children, and our grandchildren. We must realize that the point of serving Christ is to offer Him your life 
is a living sacrifice. It's a costly mission. Now, for those who go, it can cost them their lives. And let me just say that with all the strategies, for example, that I've seen for the Muslim world among evangelicals, they're probably all going to fail because every single one of them is a strategy to reach Muslims and come out alive. You think about it. Every one of the strategies, let's reach the Muslims and let's keep our missionaries alive. Now, I have nothing against keeping our missionaries alive. But if that is a sine qua non, if that is a requirement, we'll never reach the lost world because it has always cost us our lives. For those of us who stay here, like George and myself, and we seek to encourage and to share the Word of God and to mobilize our churches into this grand mission of Jesus Christ, it must cost us too. And it will cost us our time in prayer. And it will cost us our tears of sorrow when some of our missionary friends do lose their lives or lose their health or lose their children. And it will cost us our, our convenience when we go on short-term mission trips so that we too can understand the world. And it will cost us our funds because we will impoverish ourselves as the richest nation in the history of the world in order to reach the lost and the broken around the world. Now, I know when I'm talking to Presbyterians, there are a lot of us here with Scottish backgrounds, like myself. We're not known for our liberality, are we? You know, Scottish people are famous for buttoning up their pocketbook. You know, there's a story of some, some men, three men who were at tea in London, and uh, there were three of them there. One was from Georgia, uh, one was from London, and one was from Edinburgh, Scotland. And it turned out that when they were served their little bowl of soup, that all of them had a fly in their soup. For the guy from Georgia, it was easy. He just flicked the fly out and ate the soup, no problem. For the man from London, it was also easy to fix. He called the maitre d' or the waiter, and he said, please replace this entire setting. For the man from Edinburgh, Scotland, he took the fly by the wings and said, spit it out. I know what it feels like when some preacher or some anybody tells you that this is going to demand your finances. I know what it's like to clutch after what you've got because we're a people who spend money we don't have to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't like, frankly. But there's no way around it, folks. If we're involved in the Great Commission, you're going to have to change your lifestyle. If you're following the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to have to cut back, not just so that you can say, I'm cutting back, but so that you can give liberally and joyfully for the Great Commission. And you have in your insert this very morning some wonderful enterprises that need your gifts. When you give your gifts, let's overwhelm the missions committee and give them the resources that First Presbyterian and Second Presbyterian can give them, which will be saying to our World Missions Committee, you all are not thinking big enough. Somehow you may have underestimated our financial resources. Or you may have underestimated the needs of the world. But if you folks would please get on it and tell us how we can get more engaged with more of our resources, I think that would be a wonderful thing on March the 11th, 2012, for this congregation to say to your missions leaders. Because it's a costly mission. If you're not tithing, you haven't begun. Tithing is for kindergartners. Now, as you grow in the faith, let's move away from tithing. And one way you can do it is to take some of those gifts beyond 10% and put them right into the missions fund. And let's get moving on it. And let's cut back some of our ambitions for how we're going to retire and the golf course that we're going to live on when we're 65. You know what? You know how much there is in the Bible about retirement? Let me give you all the verses. Ready? Did you get them? That was it. Nothing. So if you're old, you've got money, let's get, moving that, get that money moving. If you're younger and you don't realize you're going to have an estate when you die, start planning now to have part of that go for the cause of the mission of Jesus Christ. Some of you say, well, I'm not wealthy. Well, look, I'm not either. I'll just tell you what I did. I have five children. They're not going to get much. <laughs> my daughter thinks she's going to get my library. We'll see. But that's about all I've got to give. But whatever I have to give, I just now have six children. The sixth child is the Christian mission. 
I just adopted the Christian mission as one of my children. I suggest you do the same thing. And you figure out how to get those funds into the hands of people who are going to engage this costly mission. Because it costs. And you know what? I'm glad it does. Because just as David said, I will not give an offering to the Lord that costs me nothing. And I don't want to worship God if it doesn't cost me anything. It brings me no satisfaction, no joy, no humor if it is not costing me to worship Him. And if you know Him, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The Christian mission is a costly mission. Fifthly, the Christian mission is a faith mission. Look at verses 4 through 8. He says, I want you to go out there and evangelize. I want you to reach these Samaritan villages, and I don't want you to take any money with you. You say, huh? I thought we were just talking about money. Here's the point he's making. I want you to understand that ultimately it's not your money. Ultimately, it's not your intelligence or your training or your cross-cultural expertise. Ultimately, it is the living God who is on mission, and he's simply using you, regardless of how incompetent we may be regardless of how poor we may be. He has chosen to use his own people. Now, if I were in charge of this thing, you know, George said a moment ago, Sandy's sort of strategic and methodical, and I agree, my undergraduate degree was in engineering. I can't help it. So if I'm engineering this thing, I'm sending angels out there, folks, because they don't sin, they're not selfish, and they don't die on you. I'm sending angels, but for some reason, God, the deity, doesn't send angels. He sends you. And I have no idea why. Except that he is advancing the glory of his name through sending out redeemed sinners. You know, angels, they don't know what redemption is about. They never fell. At least the ones that are in heaven. We've fallen and we know about the grace of God. He sends out people with gracious experience to tell others about the grace of God. It's a wonderful plan. And we need him to do it. And without him, we can't do it. I discovered this some years ago when I signed up on my little card for a short-term missions trip. And I signed up for a family missions trip, and my family was very young at the time. I have five children. The youngest was three. We took all four children on this family missions trip to Haiti, Port-au-Prince, Haiti, in the middle of June to work with some very impoverished people for a week. Allison, myself, and our four children. I got to the desk in Atlanta airport, and I said, Port-au-Prince, Haiti. I'm sure I was clear on this. The woman somehow heard me say, Bonn, West Germany. I have no idea how she got that in her head, but that's where my baggage went, to Bonn, West Germany. I get to Port-au-Prince. I remind you, Port-au-Prince, Haiti, in the middle of June. It is hot. It is sultry. And we are there in the middle of that city with very poor sewage control, all kinds of filth and bugs and everything. I don't have a toothbrush. I don't have underwear. Nobody has any of that. Here's what I learned after a week of that. You don't need all that stuff. And you don't need all your stuff either. There's one thing we need. That's a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And just as He was gracious to save you by the blood of the cross, He is gracious to empower you by the infilling of His Spirit. And He takes little people like us, and He fills us with His Spirit. And we can have a fruitful ministry in the middle of Port-au-Prince, Haiti, in June, with four little children with no underwear. You can do it. Let me tell you another side benefit, by the way. When we got home, sitting on our front porch were these bags. And it's such a delight after a hot, dirty trip like that to come home and open your suitcases and everything's clean and folded and you just put it back on the shelf just the, <laughs> just the way you got it. And I began to think, maybe we should just do this more often. <laughs> God will always provide for you, ladies and gentlemen. You engage His mission. Do you think He's going to leave you alone? Do you think He's going to abandon you and you put your life on the line or you cut your income so that you can support others who need to know the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you think that He'll ignore you and not notice what you did for Him? The mind cannot conceive what God has stored up for His people. And the writer of Hebrews tells us He is a just God and He will never forget how you have loved His people and served them. Well, let's move on because time is, is moving whether we do or not. Uh, let's look, notice sixthly in verse 9. The Christian mission is a holistic mission. Holistic. That means it's comprehensive. That means it covers every aspect of the person's life. 
Look what Jesus says. It's in his life and it's in his instructions. Heal the sick. I'm telling you there are children who die from starvation every seven seconds. You do the arithmetic while we've been in here. How many children have died unnecessarily of starvation? Jesus says, you go and heal the sick. Take care of them. And it's obvious. How could we go somewhere and say we're evangelizing people because we really love them, yet we don't take care of their food, housing, clothing, and educational needs? It'd be like saying to you parents, you know, really, all you need to do is evangelize your children. Don't bother about a school education. Don't even feed them. And don't, you don't have to give them a bed to sleep in. It's not important. What's important is they know Jesus and get to heaven, all right? You'd say, that's ridiculous. Exactly. It's ridiculous for us to go in Augusta or anywhere in the world and say, we don't care about every need in your life. We do care. And Jesus commanded us to care and to do something about it. But then notice what he says. Heal the sick and tell them. Evangelize them. Preach to them. Tell them about the kingdom of heaven. For if you provide education and food, and water, and housing, and law enforcement, and everything that a community needs, and you forget to tell them about Jesus Christ, all you've done is to put a 70-year Band-Aid on people's problems. It's a nice Band-Aid. It'll work for 70 years. But after 70, it doesn't work anymore because people die and face the judgment of God. Now, in broader international evangelical circles, there are big debates about this, the relationship between Mercy Ministry, and Proclamation Ministries. Even at Lausanne 3, World Congress on Evangelism, a year and a half ago in Cape Town, South Africa, there was debate, mostly behind the scenes, about what the relationship to these two are. Everyone agrees they're both essential. Some believe that they're equally necessary. I would like to say this to you. I'd like to repeat to you what John Piper said to us in that Congress after he had thought all night about it before his sermon. He said that we care about all of the needs and afflictions of the world's people. And we especially care about their eternal afflictions. Just do the math. Which has priority? The one that affects their welfare the longest. They're both essential. But we must cut, uh, we must cut through the, the jungles of, of brokenness and lostness primarily with preaching the gospel. But we love people, so we do it all. That's what Jesus told us to do. It's a holy mission. Lastly, number seven. When you look at verse 10, verses 10 through 16, you see this. The Christian mission, ultimately, is His mission. Yes, it's every Christian's mission. Yes, it's a global mission. But it is ultimately His mission. And here's why this is so important. Jesus said, I want to equip you before you get out there how you're going to handle the people who abuse you or disagree with you or mock you or scorn you because you're proclaiming a kingdom that is largely invisible to people. You look like the village idiot. I'm going to tell you ahead of time how you react to this. He says, here's what you need to know. If anybody listens to you, it's because they're listening to me. And you can count on that. Campus outreach workers, is it not true? You know every time when you get the attention of a college student, there's one reason. God is opening their hearts. If they listen to you, they're listening to me. And he says the corollary is this. If they reject you, don't take it personally. Because they've rejected me. And that brings about a very different reaction when we know that we're merely the agents and the ambassadors and the mediators and not the Lord of the harvest ourselves. And we take our humble place as messengers, simple messengers and servants around the world, and we find our delight in it as we shall see tonight as we continue to study this chapter. Ladies and gentlemen, the card has been given to you. You'll contemplate it this afternoon. You'll bring it back tonight. Will it be one that's your best answer for the Great Commission of the great Lord Jesus Christ? Let us pray. Father, thank you for this high privilege of engaging 
your business here and around the world. Thank you for ennobling your people by calling us to be your fellow laborers. And we pray now in these moments of silence and meditation that you will hear us as we offer ourselves to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.